Now, Derek was on with us yesterday. We talked about Hanky. Who knew, Derek, that just a few hours later, he would make the decision for everybody walking out the door. So, what kind of level of shock did you have? Well, I certainly had shock over when it happened. Uh, You know, I do think that the team legitimately wanted him to stay. Now, whether or not the capacity they wanted him to stay was realistic, uh, especially for a guy who had been, you know, basically been the final say in basketball operations for a good two and a half years. Uh, But I do think they at the very least wanted him to stay through the end of the season to go through the draft process uh, because this is the team that, you know, he's put in place. These are his guys. These are, you know, he's he's a very big part of that draft process. Uh, that is something he does personally and something that he prioritizes very much. So for Brian Colangelo to come in, uh, you know, get to know this staff, get to know these prospects, uh, maybe make an addition or two, which, which is very much in the cards. Um, I am told he's going to keep most of the staff that's currently in place, but, you know, he might make an addition or two. It's just it's a lot to get caught up in three months. And when you look at it with how important this draft is, with how important you know the free agency is, with how important the decisions they're going to have to make over, uh, you know, with Embiid and with Okafor and with Noel, this is a very important time. And there's not much time to make these very key and decisions that have long-term ramifications. So I thought I thought they were going to find a way at the very least for Sam to stay on with the team through the draft uh, and, and I, I mean, at the very least, stay on the final week of the season and do this in the offseason. So, yeah, the timing of it certainly shocked me. Um, behind the do- closed doors, in, in your in your opinion then, I guess, was this basically um, Sam basically saying that the organization turned their back on him? I mean, is that what this letter and him stepping down at this time essentially says that you guys turned your back on me? Yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly a part of that. Uh, I think there's an autonomy part where Sam wanted, you know, he didn't want to share that, not necessarily that he didn't want to take other people's input, but that I think he wanted the final say in in what's going to go on and at the very least not be third on the totem pole. Um, you know, like I said, they I have been told that they did want him to stay. Now, the exact capacity, I don't know. If it was just, say, you know, in charge of the analytics department. I don't think that's something Sam interest, Sam Hinkie's interested in in this stage of his career. So yeah, I think it's you know diminished role. You know, they're going to say, and and I, I've been told this. They're going to tell everyone this that they wanted him to stay, and that's probably true in the, a very specific role. But when you take a guy, you you put a Jerry Colangelo in front of him, and then you add his Jerry Colangelo's son into the mix and say you're on equal footing. But are you really on equal footing when it's his son? I mean, he's, he's, he's going to defer to him almost any time. So asking him, you know, I, I think, yeah, they probably would have been okay if he would have stayed. By the same token, I think they they knew what they were doing as well. All right. I, I want to bring up that, you know, we'll get into a lot here. You wrote a great piece at phillymag.com about it, Derek, uh, almost 13 pages long. How long was this thing here? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was not quite 13 pages. <laughs> it, it was only maybe about – a third of Sam's, maybe. <laughs> well, and I didn't use nearly as many big words or impressive <laughs> Brian Colangelo. All right, so Jerry comes in, and there was a lot of talk that this was going to happen. Just on that alone, does that rub you the wrong way? Is he the best candidate for this position? In other words, if Sam walks out the door in his own volition, and they held a open search, would people be lining up? for this job is this a good job well there, I mean there's only 30 NBA uh, GM jobs uh, if you're going to say maybe he's in the you know if they hire another guy um, he's, I mean he's probably going to hold the GM title regardless of whether you know Jerry Colangelo and, and the fact that we now have to say a first name with all these guys is going to take some getting used to but the fact that Jerry Colangelo is in there kind of muddles it a little bit there's still only 30 NBA GM jobs so yeah I mean I think you're going to be able to attract uh, I mean, look, the Nets were able to hire somebody. So certainly you look at the, the Sixers situation with all the talent they have, with the draft picks they have coming in, then you look at the Nets situation and all the draft picks they don't have and all the talent they they, they don't have. Um, yeah, no, I think uh, I think you could have you could have gotten some talent to look at, at this, draft, or this job. 
yeah, you know, that, that that's one of the things that kind of think rubs, is rubbing people the wrong way is that they were basically telling Sam, hey, you're going to work with this guy's son. And, you know, uh, I don't know that uh, that would make me feel very good. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are angry at Sam for walking away. Do you blame him? I, I personally would have liked to have seen him finish out the year and get through the draft. Uh, I do think they put his, they, he put them in a little bit of a tough situation. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened because, I mean, this is something they've been talking about adding a guy, we'll, we'll, we'll call it like Brian and pretend that this, this hasn't been basically figured out for months. Um, but they've been looking at a guy in his position next to Sam with Sam for months. Uh, so this isn't necessarily something that he is surprised by. Um, so I'd like to know exactly what caused him, what happened in the last week where he just said, you know what, enough. Like, I, I'm not finishing out the draft. I'm not even finishing out the season. I want to know what the tipping point was. Because, yeah, I, I do personally, I would have liked to have seen him get them through the draft and at least, you know, get through that crucial period. Uh, we're talking with Derek Bodner from phillymag.com. He covers the 76ers. Uh, trust the process was kind of the rallying cry. So most people would say that would mean you're judging this team based on the progression that they've made. While wins and losses were not there, is it fair to judge his record and say that he was a failure during his t- tenure here? Well, I mean, I don't. And look, I do think this year was a step back. I don't think anybody expected them to be 10 win bad. Um, I don't think Sam would say that he expected them to be this bad. I certainly didn't expect them to be this bad. Uh, it was certainly a very frustrating season, and I do think you run the risk of losing, you know, losing players, losing coaches, losing fans. Um, it was it was an order of magnitude worse than it should have been. Uh, but I do think if you look at where they are now and where they were when he came in. There's no question they have more talent that can develop into real difference makers. Uh, there's no question that they have draft picks and ways to go about acquiring other players that maybe aren't on the roster yet but who could become real difference makers. I think they're in a much better situation now than they were before Sam got here, and maybe it doesn't look that way because of record, because of you know Joel Embiid and him not playing or this – Sixers pick, which could be, it's guaranteed to be top four. This Lakers pick, which could be four or five. Just a couple of, of really high-value picks and really high-value players coming into the pipeline. You know, I do think they're in a, I think this, the position isn't nearly as bad as maybe it looks if you look at the record. Yeah, I, I think that's something that the, the, the people who are anti what they're doing really need to hear is the record on the floor, while it looks horrible, really isn't indicative of where this team is, correct? No, I mean this is uh you know the, the the hardest part is always getting that that real difference maker and you can say yeah there's no certainty right now that they have that but oh by the way it's extremely difficult to get one of those and to have certainty uh, even when you are lucky enough to grab you know draft one like maybe a Steph Curry you don't know that he's a superstar right away he still has those ankle problems which could pop back up he still has question marks I mean there was it's insane right now to go back and look at it but there's a question of whether you build around Monte Ellis or Steph Curry in their first couple years in the league so this idea that certainty comes you know you basically you draft a player and boom you're ready to go it's just not the way it usually works out and certainly with the decisions they've made by trading MCW for the Lakers pick which I wholeheartedly support by taking guys like Embiid who can't play right away it's pushed that back a little bit but uh, yeah no I mean I think uh, uncertainty yeah it's still there but I do look at some of these guys, and, and I think the future is pretty bright. Uh, Derek Bodner's with us, Philly Mag, uh, looking at the decision for Sam Henke to just walk away from uh, the Philadelphia 76ers. And in today's NBA, will this be duplicated? Will other teams, if the Sixers three years from now are a pretty good team, will more of this pop up? Uh, I don't I don't think so, no. Uh, I mean, look – Will teams tank the second half of the season, maybe even a full season? Yeah, sure. I think that's always been in the cards. I think, you know, I think when I when the, Sam Hankey got here and they first started this, you looked at the draft, and even even when he got here in May of 2013, and maybe you go through the draft and he makes the Drew Holiday trade, and you go, oh man, they're going to be really bad this year. And you look at the draft the coming up the next coming year, and you look at Andrew Wiggins, you look at Jabari Parker. And you saw Julius Randle, and you said, that's a really good draft. 
like this makes sense. I, I'm on board. I don't think anybody then expected to see year two and year three. I think you could see one year tanking. I certainly think you could see half a season tanking. Uh, a realistic appraisal of your situation where it makes sense to then go chase a draft pick. That, I think, is still in the cards. Multi-year tanking. I mean, look, can you get the right combination of GM and, and owner? Maybe. But the fact that even if they get good, the fact that Sam Hinkie is not going to be the one. And, and look, I think even him walking away, it's not going to change the fact that everybody knows he was pretty much, you know, if not officially pushed out, then made his life made very difficult. And if he's not going to be here to reap those rewards, then I don't think even if it works, people are going to look to really cop- copy it. Derek, is your view of Jerry Colangelo's entry into this organization changed at all? I wouldn't say it's really changed because I think this is really what I expected. Well, I mean, uh, meaning you know like, what? maybe I should clear up, meaning the reason why he's here. Who put him here? How did he get here? Um, why oh, he's well, here? I don't think it was that that collaborative process that they were throwing out at the beginning. I think that's, that's pretty clear at this point. Um, you know, I do think it's still largely a perception problem, and perception problem with the fans, perception problem with, you know, agents and and free agents, I do think is something that's on ownership's mind and those relationships that Hanky maybe didn't build as well as he should have. And I think maybe if he ever gets another chance to be a general manager, maybe he'll try to learn from that a little bit. Um, no, I mean, I, I think the reason he's here is still probably the same as I would have said back then uh, in that it's, you know, a largely perception um, and relationships. And I do think that's a, a really big part of it. Uh, how much of a role do you feel that the Sixers ownership group plays in moving forward now? What Because a lot of people keep asking, you know, okay, now what? So what's the plan? Who's in – who's – you know, I don't want. Uh, I guess who's in charge? I mean, Colangelo. I guess is kind of the, the guy who's got the largest voice now. But are they deviating from where they were? Did they like? Where, did in other words, did Josh Harris like what was going on, but just didn't want Hinky to have so much power? So is 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 Harris going to allow Colangelo to kind of deviate and do what he wants to do, or does does Harris still want to kind of stay the course? You know, I think they probably both want to stay the course to some degree. You know, I do think they certainly want to use free agency as a a, a bigger tool this off season. But I think they still know, at least to some degree, that you know the draft is going to be really important. That using that cap space wisely and not just spending it, spending it is going to be important. Um, I I do think they're going to change. But I mean, to your question, you know, Colangelo's the like you said the biggest voice, not the day to gate day guy that's going to be Brian. Um, but I mean, it's uh, you know, it's it's a great question about ownership because this is an, an ownership group that you know inherited the Doug Collins, um, Rod Thorne, Tony DeLeo triumvirate and kind of threw that out there for a couple years where they, you know, you had those three people with with various uncertain roles in the organization. Uh, that didn't work. They brought went a completely about face. So they completely bought into what Doug Collins was saying, the basketball guy, the persuasive basketball guy. They recognized they didn't really know anything about the sport. Went a completely different direction with Hinky, and now it seems like they're going back to that, you know, respected old school basketball guy. And it just seems like they don't. I'm not sure they entirely know what they're looking for in a direction. And I think that to me is is very troubling. Yeah, and um, you, you're right about that. Is uh, Hinky for all his fault, and, and let me ask you about that. You know, there was so much talk about him having bad communication skills. The other jo- owners, uh, GMs, didn't want to talk to him around the league. He was not very good at calling people back. Uh, was that ultimately? It's almost like a Chip Kelly thing. Like this guy was a smart guy. He had good plans, but was that his ultimate downfall? Was that he was not a good communicator? Uh, I wouldn't say it's his ultimate downfall. I mean, look, if if they're sitting here with Carl Anthony Towns, a healthy Joel Embiid, they're winning 25 games and you see two stars on the roster, are they going to fire him? Some GMs or agents complain that he's hard to get in contact with. That's not going to happen. Uh, they're going to live with whatever problems he has um, in, in that capacity. Uh, you know, to, to me, I think he needed, you know, one of real three things to... to um, to see this through, 
And that was either to get lucky in the draft, to be perfect in the draft, hmm. or to have patience from ownership. And I think what happened is, you know, maybe his, his other shortcomings as a general manager, as a communicator, influenced that patience. But I certainly think there are, are ways that this unfolds where he's still here, even with his flaws. What you make of the letter? I mean, what's the feeling you got at the end of that letter? Was it, you know, because I'm reading this letter and I'm thinking, this guy is basically outlining everything that he did, almost showing these guys, look where we were, look where I got you, and you want me to work for this guy's punk kid? Are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> what did you... The, the reaction you got at the end of that letter. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's clearly, you know, he wanted his side heard uh, and maybe not, maybe in, in an environment that he was a little bit more comfortable with. And clearly he is uh, a very well-written guy. Uh, he can, he's, he's comfortable writing a report like that. Uh, and maybe he just prefers that over maybe an interview, a one-on-one, a sit-down with, you know, an, uh, the national media type. Um, I do think he wanted to get his story out there. Uh, and I think it was a little bit of, you know, I don't know right now if he's looking to get right back into it with another team. But if he is, certainly I think explaining his thought process helps. And he certainly comes off as a smart, articulate, you know, well-thought-out guy. Um, you know, I'm not sure it was necessarily the best look, though. I do think it comes off as a little bit, a little pettier than maybe you want to in that situation um just it's it's i don't know it came off as he was trying uh, to me a little bit too hard uh i would have probably found a more subtle way to go about that <laughs> um talk with derek bodger here at phillymag.com who covers the sixers he has a uh very long piece on the uh end of the hinky era and you know for for all the ups and downs, that 2014 will really be the big unknown. That that he really, where would this team be if if 14, if Embiid's not hurt and Sarge plays? I mean, we we we're, we're most certainly singing a different tune. And I think that's what a lot of the Sixers fans, where the disconnect comes in, is they're judging this team based on where they are today. When today really can't be. It's like Back to the Future. There's like an alternate 1985 here that we really can't judge on because 14 is almost as that offseason never existed yet yeah i mean if, if 14 happens where and like you said and be healthy sarge is here everything about the team is completely different to the, even the if, way it's viewed even by. if him beats a stiff at least you know that yeah well I, I see almost no chance of him being a stiff uh he either his leg falls off or he's a very good player in my mind um <laughs> i mean not necessarily because you know there's the layoff and all that stuff but i'm, I'm pretty confident in him being a good player um but I mean, everything about the team changes. Your certainty about you, basically, if Embiid's playing and Sarge is playing, to me, it becomes a lot clearer why you're going through this painful rebuild. Uh, so certainly, I mean, it's something that I think he was certainly at peace with in the risk department. Uh, maybe he didn't expect him to be out two years, but I, th- I think certainly he knew this wasn't a a necessarily safe, guaranteed play which always to me then comes back to the ownership group. And he clearly thought that he had the um, job security and they had the patience to allow him, look, if this doesn't work out 100% right away, I'm going to have a chance to rectify that. And yeah, maybe he should have gone out and signed some more veterans, got a point guard, they go out and they win 18 to 22 games. Maybe that keeps him here too. Maybe not because there's still that uncertainty about getting a superstar in the draft. Uh, it, it's just to me very... You know, you just don't know exactly what the the final straw was. Was it Okafor getting in or getting into the trouble he got into? Was it just the the sheer volume of losing? It's probably all of that, and combined with the uncertainty. But yeah, I mean, it's a fourteen works out differently. It's a whole whole different universe. No doubt about it. Uh, can you just kind of go over Derek? How far? off the floor he brought this team you know when he took over to where they are now some of the things really stand out that I think you know people again judge based on wins and losses and don't understand the disaster that he kind of took over in terms of assets and the options that they have well I think what's what's kind of amazing and and, and somebody brought this up to me and I forget who I think it might have been Rich Hoffman of Philly Voice Um, they only had two players on that team on a rookie scale contract 
uh, and I think it was Evan Turner and Arnett Moultrie uh, on the team he inherited. They were out two first-round picks. Uh, they had just traded away, obviously, their best player in Iguodala. Uh, Bynum was a bust. They traded away the best player in Vucevic, best young player in Vucevic, and their most recent first-round draft pick in Mo Harkless. I mean, the cupboard was legitimately very bare. Uh, and so to... And the problem is they had enough good veterans in Drew Holiday and Thaddeus Young, Evan Turner, Spencer Hawes, that the few picks they did have weren't good enough to really replenish that. Um, so to be sitting here, and yeah, maybe we haven't gotten what we expected from top three picks, certainly in Embiid because he hasn't played, or in Okafor, but to have that kind of upside on the roster and to have as many first-round picks as they do have, and again, something they had almost none of just three years ago, you know, you have options, and, and getting a, a really great player is just so hard to have that many different paths and that many options. Yeah, it might not work out, but I always, I'm, I'm much more willing to take a risk at something great, something great. I mean, that's why I've always supported Embiid so much, but take a risk at something great. Take a risk at Ben Simmons. Take a, take a risk at, you know, Brandon Ingram. Take a risk at whoever you want to say. Um, to me, it's, it's always worth it because not taking that risk and not having any real avenue of getting a great player, that to me is the bigger risk. So um, you know, if it doesn't work out, I think it was worth the shot. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things in this letter, too, that he maps out, the style of play that he really wanted, and then he kind of indicates Golden State is following the model that he set forward. I ask you this. Um, a lot of people have said, I don't have a problem with the plan, but it was poorly executed. Do you agree with that? Uh, I mean, there are some areas I would certainly nitpick with. Uh, I think at this point, look, not many people knew even who Giannis Antetokounmpo was at that point, and certainly not many people had him going 11th, but he's clearly a better talent than Michael Carter-Williams. He's clearly more valuable than the Lakers draft pick they traded Michael Carter-Williams for. Certainly you could point to that. Uh, Rudy Gobert being drafted after that. Uh, you know, the, the 20... 15 draft is something that I have personally questioned, uh, not only just because Okafor, I don't think, can fit with either Noel or Embiid, uh, whereas Porzingis can fit wonderfully with both of them, but also just because I think Porzingis has more long-term upside, specifically because he can make an impact on both ends of the court. Uh, You can nitpick certainly about the point guards that he went into the third season with, uh, the lack of veterans that he went in the third season with. And, you know, I think somebody like Luke Bamute last year provided a lot of value in the locker room on the practice floor and his, you know, ability to really almost serve as a, as a coach on the floor and really just as a player who could make that defense kind of mesh. Uh, and I think I would have liked to have seen him back. But if you're looking at what's really going to change the franchise long term, and what's really going to set them on a path to being relevant. You know, it's still it's still these these things, uh, a combination of Embiid, a combination of Sarge, maybe Okafor and Well developing more than we expect them to. This this draft that should be or that is guaranteed to be in the top four this year, this Lakers pick, this even this twenty seventeen pick, that's still what's going to de- determine whether or not the Sixers are great. And they have so many of those, you know, assets that can turn into high value um, players or things that maybe a, a draft or a trade now becomes a more realistic part and once a trade is done maybe free agency now comes in but turning these into something is still uh, you know it's still, it's still going to determine their future um, and I think that's kind of always been the case uh, I do think the the draft is still huge for this team so they have to hit it and maybe and, and, and Sam will say that they've never really been unlucky they've gotten third pick and they've been slotted to get the third pick. But a little bit of luck on lottery night would would not hurt as well. Uh, Derek Botter, read his uh, piece over at Philly Mag, how trusting the process uh, basically um, turned into, again, I agree that the management basically turned their back on here. Sam Henke, the Sixers rebuild and trusting the process. It's over at phillymag.com. Derek, thanks, man. Thank you.